Oh, so I just have mixed feelings about the aging technology. I think it just depends on the actor and the director. And, you know, obviously I think for certain films it's a good thing. And for some films it's it kind of like, it's like maybe we should get a new actor who's younger. You know what I mean? You know, there is a new generation of talent that need to rise up. Not rise up, but that need to like have be represented, you know? But also you have the same thing where it's like, some of the older actors are the better actors. Do you know what I mean? You don't have young actors as good as the older actors at all. I, I don't think so. Do you know what I mean? Or it's very, very, very rare. Like, who's the young Meryl Streep, right? Like, we don't know. Like, you know what I mean? I, I mean, there's there's actually quite a few, probably, you know? But in Hollywood, I'm talking about. In France, you have so many. <laughs> My name's Mikhail, Mikhail Snani, and I'm originally from Hong Kong. I'm British, um, but I'm Indian also, and I'm uh, a queer filmmaker. Uh, so I started a long time ago, uh, I guess I started working in internships with an LGBT director named Casper Andres back in 2007. And I actually wanted to be an actor then, and I auditioned for Slumdog Millionaire, but I didn't get the part. Uh, I think I was too gay to be like the Indian hero for Latika and stuff. Uh, so I ended up working behind the scenes. And then uh, after I was at Tufts University at the time in Boston, and then I moved back to Hong Kong. And what happened was, which I only sort of realized recently, was uh, these people at Tufts started using my life as like inspiration for art. And I didn't really know much that was going on, and it lasted for many years until now, even. But in terms of my own filmmaking, I then just did like production assistant jobs on different features that were very indie, very low budget. Even a French feature I worked on, it was so hard to speak French. It was called La Rive d'un Don Tiphon. And um, so it was really hard because I wanted to be a writer. and. It was, I was in Hong Kong and everything's in Chinese apart from this one French film. And so I started directing my own shorts. So when I started directing my own shorts, I eventually got into graduate school in 2017. I went to Chapman University for my MFA in screenwriting. And then over there, I, even though I was in the screenwriting program, I decided to make my own independent studies and direct a whole bunch of shorts, which played in a lot of festivals. Then I started working for, uh, I, I sort of, I guess I invented this concept of Boogeyman, which was like this voice switch based on the short called My Boyfriend. And I started working for a director, writer, Stephen D'Souza, who did Die Hard and Tomb Raider and all those big budget Hollywood movies. And then I guess the industry was remaking my work and with him, I developed a feature script called Boogeyman the Crossing and it just like life in LA just sort of became like a once upon a time in Hollywood thing, but it didn't, it sort of stayed on forever. And uh, now I'm back in Hong Kong and stressing out because I just made two more shorts and it's not even about like the stress of making the shorts anymore. Cause I've done it so many times. I, I do these one man shows now um, because it was hard to get funding for a lot of my work after graduate school because LA is a very expensive place to be and it's very expensive to make films over there. Um, so I started doing these one man shows and now what I stress out about is the export time it takes just to export the film even though you're doing nothing because you're just like this is so frustrating and it takes like an hour on your laptop. Um, and so, yeah, I moved back to Hong Kong in October and I've been here since and I'm still writing and directing and yeah, that's how it is so far and just planning the next steps. Cool, cool. It's, uh, so I have a lot of, basically, <laughs> at different places, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I guess, you know, this is one of those international cities. So everyone here moved out of Hong that spoke English pretty much that I went to school with because I went to an international school and everyone who stayed in Hong Kong are just like into banking or finance or, or law or like uh, you know those more corporate careers and things like that 
uh, or their teachers, because there's a big community here of English teachers for the local schools and things like that. Uh, and Hong Kong used to be a much bigger place in filmmaking, you know. Actually, um, it used to be the third largest filmmaking uh, sort of place in the world before 1997, when the British were still here. And then I was actually telling the story recently. I, I did one of my web series when I was younger. I got it edited in the Shaw Brothers studio because my friend, his dad worked there. And um, it's like what happened was all the sort of children that inherited the the movie industry, the movie like business, decided to use all the money in like hotels and and restaurants and, you know, more safer money making things, you know, so then the industry, one of the biggest pioneers of the industry here started making less and less movies. And then Hollywood was coming into Hong Kong much less and less after China um, came over and everything as well. So it just shrunk and shrunk the industry over here. And now what's happened with it is I'm, I have, I've been out of it for so long and I haven't really been in the local industry so much, but I know there's a lot of like, uh, I don't know if it's like censorship, but there's a lot of rules with what can be, what is like allowed to be on the films here. And a lot of people were complaining and protesting and things like that. And you still have the Hong Kong International Film Festival, which is very renowned. And you still have, you know, uh, there's still our film festivals. And they're actually the only, like, you have the local ones. And then the only foreign ones, you have the Jewish festival and you have the French film festival. So there's a big French group here and a French, big French acting group here, you know, where they just have, I'm like, why would yet the acting actors all like, how did, like, I don't know how that happened, but it's just, that's just, there's a community here for filmmakers and, and stuff with these niche groups of expats that live in Hong Kong. And for me, it's very hard for me to fit in because in all of that, you know, I don't really speak the language, you know, like the French I know is from Dexter's Laboratory, like Omelette du Fromage, Je m'appelle Le Kale, very basic stuff. And uh, so for me, it's just kind of like been very hard over here because I'm not able to pursue my ambitions so much. And so what happens is just like other people here, I, you know, move overseas or, you know, and then we come back to Hong Kong just to like rest, visit our family you know, do a little shopping or something, you know, eat some good food because when you're living alone, you know, you can get, you can get, you can get burnt out a lot easier. And, uh, you know, just maybe for like a few months, it's nice to have a parent look after you for a little bit because the industry is so ruthless and it's so cutthroat and it's so competitive. You know what I mean? Like, I could be writing one film and I'm like, okay, this is going to be the next thing. And then suddenly a studio takes it or something else happens. And you're just kind of like, oh, they, they just made what I wanted to make or something like that. And then you're just like, oh, damn it. What do I do? And it's just like such a race all the time. But it's like one of those weird things where it's like they race to like make the film, but then also the film has to be really good. So it's also like, oh, you can't go too fast because then you're going to rush it and then mess it up. So it's a very complicated thing, I find, the industry. And being in Hong Kong has been one of those places where because of not being able to work so much like in L.A. or in London where I can just get a job, I've had to learn how to do a lot of the things by myself, you know, or learn from other, like, indie directors. And that's, I guess, made me a lot more well-rounded when it comes to filmmaking because... I remember, for example, going to grad school and you have a lot of the directors there that they're like, okay, we're just the director. And they didn't have a lot of experience on the other stuff. So it's like you see them on set and they just like sit on the chair and they're just like action and trying to just do the basics. Whereas if you like know or you have experience doing all the different things, you go from department to department and you're like, okay, let me make sure this is good. Let me make sure this is good, you know, and you're able to keep track of all the stuff. Yeah, so we talked about the uh, making communities and uh, um, talk about schools, about film schools. Do you think the difference between uh, the two? It's like um, you have an establishment um, school, of course, with different rules. You have their uh, network, basically, in, in film school. And the, the commu filmmaking communities, it's like you said, it's hard to fit in. 
in a way because you say you there's a language barrier basically oh yeah yeah definitely cool is the community is so good like at chapman we have a master class every week with like like this week there's brendan fraser talking last week it was colin farrell the week before it was daniels the week before like every week it's some oscar winning person or something like that and my professors who are all like the best in the industry you know so the network is very very strong and very good you know it was just like all when i went to filmmaking school literally the year after it was covid which was like the worst time ever to be like i'm going to be a filmmaker i'm going to like try to make it in hollywood because everything was being shut down and there was so much you know there were so many issues and there was just too much going on so it was just like really bad timing and everything for me when i went to la you know but um yeah for film school i definitely i'm i think film school is important i think it's very good you know my work got a lot better in film school uh you know it wasn't just because of the teachers it was being able to work with all the other artists around me the other students and learning from the other students i learned more from the students than i did from the teachers in film school to be honest and it's having that community of artists around you that you know that motivates you and it pushes your work and it makes your your because you collaborate more it makes the work better and you're able to help, especially if you're all that it's a diverse community and stuff you're able to put different things you learn because everyone comes from like a different background and everyone has a different style and you're able to learn how to like uh learn other people's what works for them and what doesn't work and things like that so film school is such a great learning experience you know and but it's also one of those things in film school they really leave you to your own devices so you have to put the effort in to like do the stuff you know what i mean it's not like oh i'm just going to go to like you know law school and take the exams and study you know it's like you have to like be very proactive and you have to like even though you're in school and they give you the equipment you have to get your crew together still you know what i mean you have to do all the you still have to do all the stuff you do to like I, like you actually make a film even though they have the you know the the resources to help you a little bit you know definitely uh to talk about the resources uh i will say um resource resourceful people uh around you is very helpful very handy because um you know you know i don't need a restaurant and um, you might know that there's a neighborhood in a neighborhood someone a friend of the friend has a restaurant so you can ask a friend of from a friend and then you have the rest restaurant so i've done that before like over here yes i have it's it's the thing is like in hong kong you meet so many people in that's in it, when you're like living in an international city or like a bit a cosmopolitan city where everything is close together and you go out drinking especially you meet people that like uh you know are from all the different backgrounds and the like of work and stuff and you can be like oh oh do you have like you said a restaurant do you have a, a car do you have this i can use you know but sometimes in la at least i felt when you're coming as a foreigner to a new country and you don't know everyone you know you're you're a new person there it's different because it's like oh like i need a restaurant i have to go to all the restaurants and be like hi i'm nikhail i want to make a film and then they don't trust you or they're very like pay us a lot of money or something like that you know and it's it's very different obviously when you have that um when you have that connection because also when you have the connection of like for example the resource you know like even in school you have the studio or whatever you can take more time over there or you can you don't have to be you can not that you, you don't have to be you always have to be careful but you know it's it's like there's a little bit more relaxed you know everyone's not on edge like oh my god like what if we like because you know every on every film set something breaks you know like even if it's a wall socket or something like that you're not like worried so much oh my god if we use too much electricity right now i mean you have the gaffer people to check the electricity beforehand but uh you know it's just kind of like there's a little bit less stress when you definitely are working in the community where you know the people that help and it 
it's always also more fun because then you're also like, oh, if you, you work in a restaurant with people, you know, you just, you help each other out. Cause you're like, oh, okay. For the lunchtime, we'll buy the food from the restaurant, you know, or something like that. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. you know, it's and things like that. Basically. You can predict maybe the name of the restaurant at the ending, maybe. And uh, you can buy the lunch from uh, the restaurant or the crew, as in crew. So you have different stuff, different win-win situation. You can uh, promote uh, differently for the restaurant. So yeah, you can have, you just find the solution. Yeah, the one film, the one French film I worked on, La Rive et Phone, uh, they had a rotisserie place, sponsor place, the, the place. And so what they did to get the... I guess they did it for, for food and for some props and stuff. They would use the the take bag of the rotisserie and show it in the film, like when the characters, like, I don't remember what the character was doing, but like, like going somewhere. But it's like, you know, you just do the little bit of brand promotion. But if you, you can't use the big brand promotion, you can't be like, oh, Prada, right? Unless you're doing like, you know, the, that movie Personal Shopper with Kristen Stewart. But like otherwise, it's like, uh, you know, it it definitely helps, especially with us indie productions. You know, you, you want to save money on so many things because you know our production is so small. We're not getting a studio to finance it or anything. So it's like, how can I save money by maybe promoting a brand's food or anything? And the brand, most of these brands or restaurants. They know if you make this film, they know suddenly their restaurant's not going to be sold out for weeks or anything like that. You know what I mean? It's not going to become, you know, it's not because it's an indie film, right? But also, especially one of the things about indie films is that they don't, in Hollywood, people in people know a bit too much to do this. But in, in the indie world, especially places like Hong Kong or other cities that are not in Hollywood so much, people are so like, uh, enamored by like people making films they're like oh my god you're making a film is it gonna win an oscar that's the first thing that goes to people's heads even though they don't know what's happening in the film and they're just so like um i guess they're so like moved by the the idea of the glamour of the film industry and the glamour of making a movie when it's not like that a lot of the time and so because they're so like oh my god it's a movie they're a lot of people in these cities are like, okay, like we'll we'll help out, or we'll do this, or we'll we're willing to, you know, put our brand or whatever our food or whatever in your restaurant in your movie, you know. Whereas in Hollywood, they already know that stuff. It's just kind of like another movie. There's a movie every day being made, so they're not as like, oh, like you know, big deal, you know, like sort of thing. Yeah, another one, another one. <laughs> in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, another one. So in a small city, basically, is there more um, interest to help you uh, to find something or to uh, for everything, basically? And Hollywood, yeah, of course, yeah, they, in, Los, in Los Angeles, they get used to it. So it's, oh, it's another movie film. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever, yeah. But no, I'm not interested. They, oh, they yeah, won't help sure. you, basically. They won't, uh, they're not keen to help you, basically, you know? Um, yeah, but the only small thing... City and, uh, a... Sorry. Yeah. What yeah, were you sorry. saying? Yeah, there's just a small, the small cities. The comparison between small cities and Los Angeles, but filmmaking is different. When you ask like a rest a restaurant or something like this, they will they will say no in Los Angeles. Basically, most of it. <laughs> you have to you have to look for uh, for a long time. You know, a restaurant in in a small city. In comparison with a small city, where you can go to any restaurant, they will say yes, basically yes, because they they eager to help you, they want to help you. Yeah. Yes, the only thing is in a place like Los Angeles, the 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 talent pool is also better, though. You know what I mean? Because so many people have a job, and in a place like Los Angeles, they don't think about helping you so much. They think of it as a job. You know, which is also a very American concept, if you think, which I learned when I was over there. Everything in America is very transactional. It's very job-like. And over there, because they're like, oh, this is a job. This is not us trying to help you, uh, you know. But the talent pool is better, you know. They have people more experienced because people are doing it more, you know. They, 
attract people from all around the world that are, and they have the best, um, what's it called, like educational systems for film over there also. So they bring in a lot of people that are very talented over there, you know, which definitely helped the film a lot more for sure, you know. And so in a small city, there's definitely more responsibility if you're a director, if you're making an indie film. And in Los Angeles, there's a little bit less responsibility because that responsibility is divided a little bit more against the other talents, like the producer, the DP, this, that, because everyone takes a little bit more charge of what they do because they're so um, they're so spe specific about what each role should be and what they should do and what they're getting paid to do and stuff like that. Yes, yes. I think you can you can uh, combine both. You can take your cast and crew from Los Angeles to a small city. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, ideally, that would be cool, right? That would be fun. Like, I, I've always, I made a film in Mexico. I didn't bring anyone from Los Angeles, but I thought I was, I filmed this feature called The Check-In. It, it was, it was, it was a featurette. Sorry, it was only 40 minutes long. And I was in Mexico for some visa issues. And I was like, what do I do? I'm here for a month. So I made this film, like, and it it's going to play in Mexico, but it hasn't had a very good festival run. It's, I think it got suppressed because it was about the gaslighting I've been experiencing. But, uh, you know, it was like, um, what's it called? But it was really cool. It was a one-man show, and I, like, acted in it, and I wrote it, and I directed it. I should send it to you. It's really fun. But um, what's it called? So that was really cool because when you film in another country, there's also the rules. It's also exciting because you can add so much flavor to the film. You know what I mean? Like, you have so much different sceneries you can put in. You have so much. And, and a lot of these other countries, apart from Los Angeles, are cheaper to film in as well. You know, I'm not sure about the rules in Mexico because I didn't follow the rules. But in other, a lot of countries, you don't have to. Um, in a lot of countries, like, for example, in Hong Kong, you don't have to pay for a permit to film on the street. So some countries have different rules. Whereas in L.A., just to film one scene on a road, even if it's outside your house, costs like 600 US, you know, just for the permit for one day, if even it's just one scene and it, maybe it's just, maybe just two shots, but you want, you need to film on that road for that, whatever, even if there's no traffic, it, if you want to do it properly with everything and you don't want the police to shut you down because so much filmmaking happens, the police are always checking everyone's permits and everything over there. Uh, so you have to get everything legit in Los Angeles a lot of the time. Whereas in other places you can get away with the, you know, the guerrilla filmmaking, the re rebel filmmaking, like Robert Rodriguez did in his uh, first film, the mariachi. Mm, okay. I see. So the guerrilla filmmaking is kind of uh, complicated. It's very strict in America, in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. I mean, New York is even easier than Los Angeles. New York, you can film on the streets without problems. And New York is so crowded. So I'm like, why wouldn't they do that and yeah. allow it in Los Angeles? But Los Angeles, most of the money in California comes from the filmmaking industry. So like Los Angeles, like when I lived there, it's not a very well, it's not a very rich town in general. You know what I mean? There's a lot of poverty. There's a lot of problems. There's a lot of homelessness. There's a lot of um, what's it called, uh, problems with the hospitals and things like that. The roads are not good, you know. So a lot of the time they try to get their money from two things in Los Angeles. Uh, the film industry, so paying for the permits and everything because that so, provides so much of the economy there. And also parking tickets. They like to get people to pay parking tickets a lot. <laughs> wow, okay. Well, yeah. I've heard like two... Even to commute in Los Angeles is kind of difficult. You need to, to Uber or to, to have a car. It's very difficult to... to oh, you need to have a car. You need to have a car. Uh, I had a car when I was there. Like, it's... it's There's... The public transport is... Um, I never used the public transport, but it's, it's not very good. And, uh, you know, there's so much... There's traffic a lot of the time, and everything is so far apart, you have to... You have to commute, you know, like... For example, even where I lived for most of the time I was in Los Angeles, there was, if I wanted to take a bus, 
I would have had to do like a 20 minute walk. Then I would have had to take a bus to get to another bus. And then I, you know what I mean? It would take, it would have taken me like two hours or three hours to get to work. And even then for my first, when I was in grad school, I was working in, in a, a place uh, near Malibu and it would take me an hour every day just driving in the car to get to work and an hour to come back. Sometimes two hours to come back. Two hour drive just to get back home from work. It, you I've know? heard like uh, it's, uh, even in, for the evenings uh, until uh, up to midnight, the traffic is uh, terrible. It's, uh, oh, too it's, heavy. it's not. No, that's not true. Not it's it's only like from four to seven that it's very bad. In the morning, uh, okay, four to okay, seven okay. in the morning, and I, like eight p.m. onwards, it's it's not so bad. But it's still everything is far apart because it's America. You know what I mean? So everything is just like they have a lot of space, so everything's just far apart. So it does take a while to go anywhere. But that's it's also very cool because you can drive. Some days you just feel like you want to go on a drive. And you can just go very far out. You can go to like the beach. You can go to the mountains. You know what I mean? You just you just go. It's it's peaceful. You know, just make sure you know you're not speeding or anything like that because people are a little bit crazy there sometimes when it comes to driving. I think every day on the radio you would hear accident, 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 and I'm like, oh my god, everyone is oh, dying really? in cars here. You know, like. <laughs> I, it's not true. It was probably just all the Teslas, but um, you know. But it was like Elon Musk would be so upset if he hears this, you know. But I don't know. My dad. I was just talking to. I I, I made so many jokes about Elon Musk recently. My dad messaged me today, and he was like, um, "Can you pay for me to go to the moon?" And I'm like, "Why are you asking me? Go ask Elon Musk. You know, get a ticket on SpaceX. Isn't that what they want to do? Like take people to the you know, I mean, we can talk about that a little bit. I actually, uh, one of my biggest films is called Something Round, which is a short I made, and I made a feature, and there was remakes of that done into Moonfall and some other films. And, uh, you know, so space has been, like, one of those things I, I love, you know. I would love to one day make a film in space, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, like, it's, what's it called? Like, the cosmos and... The universe. I'm very into nature. A lot of my films have nature and uh, na and the universe sort of involved in it. You know, like that's just just a little bit of a tangent about the type of films I make. Like Seed, for example. You know, it's it has to do with a garden and the seeds. You know, but um, nature and the universe are such big topics that I like to explore in my films. That. Um, that's why, even though some people don't like Elon Musk, I appreciate a lot that he does and everything because I'm like, he understands, you know, you know, space. So it's hard to understand space. You have to appreciate that sort of dedication to knowledge, you know. Yeah, definitely. But talking about uh, your film projects, can you tell me about your last uh, project? Uh, how did you get inspired? How do I get inspired? Different, so, I guess you have different projects. Which well, well, the last the one I guess I just have a project just recently released on IndieFlix. It's called Seed, which I actually filmed over a year ago. So it's not actually my last project, but uh, it's the one that just got distributed on IndieFlix, which is a great network with all these classic films and all these really good indie shorts and indie features that play at top festivals. So it's a really cool network. Um, and that film was inspired by a, a history lesson I took on medieval magic, where they would, uh, I learned in this class on magic that in the back, in the old days, they used to, um, what's it called? They used to need, uh, they used to get virgins to grow their gardens because they would think it would bring like fertility to the, the plants and things like that. And I wanted to make a film about combining, you know, the juxtaposition between medieval sort of magic and modern science a little bit or sort of modernizing it a little bit because a lot of the time in politics nowadays we see this non-believer thing in science and there's always this fight with science. What is, 
should we listen to it? Should we not listen to it? You know, uh, in every country, pretty much, there's different political groups always fighting about that. And so I wanted to make that film. So that was how that film was, came to my mind. And it was also about a lot of the, it was also a metaphor for like sort of like the exploitation that has been of my work in the industry a lot of the time as well. And a lot of the time these films come to me uh, and I said this, I got asked the same question on the last interview, but, um, you know, I take a lot of my experiences that I experience in real life and then I turn them into metaphors for films, you know, and a lot of those experiences have to, the thing that drives most of my best films come from experiences that involve, um, boys like relationships but the thing is I've never actually been in a relationship so there are always relationships with boys that have gaslit me you know that I tend to be like this I don't know why but boys just love gaslighting me and I think it's because I respond in a very creative way and so they're like oh this is cool we don't gaslight anyone else and they do this and I'm like oh you gaslit me I'm gonna paint a painting you know like and I was like it's so stupid I learned much I've learned I was very naive before and I've learned to be much better and to not respond to you know like be a lot more self-empowered and have a lot more self-love and things like that but you know a lot of the times it really is the sort of inspiration that for me are just comes from just like feelings towards people and I think it's because I grew up you know, without a lot of access to the gay community, even though I worked in gay films when I was younger. Uh, but in terms of, like, living in Hong Kong, which is quite a repressed place, you know, when I used to go out with a group of friends here from high school and afterwards, they were all straight people, you know? So I never really... I explored sort of my sexuality and stuff a little bit in secret, or just on the... Not in secret, I was always out, but it was just, like, on the side, you know, never in, like, the same sort of community that, that they sort of have in Los Angeles and things like that. So it's always really been about like the sort of like unrequited love or this sort of will it want to sort of fit in with these boys that I've liked in my life and films have been a way for me to uh, express those feelings of frustration in a healthy way. Okay, yeah, good. So how was the, the workload um, for this project, uh, Seed? Uh, because um, it was very intense, or was it easy? The process was it easy? What was the question? What was the what? I'm sorry? The workload. Oh, the workload. So I would have to say it was a lot because I'm a costume designer also. So even though I, I don't know how to sew, but I, I work as a costume designer also. That's like my, I, I just, I just, I, I, I buy the clothes. I don't actually like make them, you know? Um, but I worked, I actually like, I, I worked in this friend's festival. I was a costume designer in it. And I was the only one to win an award for costume design at this one festival. And I was like, oh my God, this is so funny. I'm winning costume design awards and I can't even sew. But anyways, um, anyways. Uh, so the workload was pretty, it was a short, so it's not too hard. And I actually, like, we started the process of, uh, we were going to film it in, like, a sep in like September, and then we ended up filming it, like, many months later. Because of COVID. So I had a lot of time to prepare because I knew I wanted to make this film. So in my mind, I prepared a lot. You know, it was during COVID, so the workload was actually less because we had, you couldn't have the same sort of rehearsals. You know, you couldn't have the same sort of things. It was before the vaccine. So um, most of it was before the vaccine. But so there was a lot of uh, things that had to be corners that had to be cut. You know, there was a lot of things that had to be shortened in terms of the process of filmmaking to, ha to make it happen because we couldn't get everyone together all the time. And... Um, but otherwise, you know, I, I work very, very fast in general. Sometimes my boss used to say I work too fast. So the workload wasn't too much. I think the hardest part of Seed, you know, I, um, you know, the script didn't take too long because it was something I wrote in grad school and then something I rewrote, I guess, over the course of a year, every now and then, touching it up here and there. 
And then getting the actors together was actually the hardest part because I wanted a witch that was a person of color. And even though it was Los Angeles, it's still very hard to find diverse talent, even though that's what like everyone wants and everything. It's still very hard to find diverse talent, especially on a low budget. And, you know, we weren't, uh, what's it called? Like, you know, a very high budget. So it's not like I could pay for someone super famous or anything to be on the film or, you know what I mean? Uh, the other two ch- uh, teenage actors were not teenagers, actually. They're, but, oh, they graduated from college, but they were um, people who went to Chapman University also. So I got old ex-students involved, and I got ex-students involved in the film making process, too. And everyone, I guess because it was L.A., everyone sort of knew what they were doing. You know, I guess a lot of the time, though, when you're an auteur and you have this one vision, you have to your workload is a lot because you have to be like, oh, okay, like, let's do it this way and let's try it this way, you know? You always say, let's try it this way. You don't say, let's do it. Let's try it this way. And um, so, you know, luckily, luckily, I was very lucky to have a producer that was so good. She handled all the paperwork. She handled all the the insurance and this and that. So I had so much of the things I was worried about taken care of because of my producer uh, and then her name was Imani Morris. And then our DP was awesome. You know, she was so on top of stuff. She would go to the camera rental place and get the lenses. I didn't have to ha- accompany her for all the stuff. She was very independent, very in charge of things, knew how to do everything. You know, so everyone was very good. And it's really about the crew you put together. You know, like my production designer, Noah Danes, was amazing. He like knew how to make like a silver leaf and make it fall and all this stuff and I was like oh wow that's really cool I mean that's really cool and you know some of the things we did on the spot sort of figuring things out you know what I mean like the silver leaf wasn't silver enough at first so I told him to spray paint it with like spray you know spray paint paint and stuff like that oh or like the leaf at the end of the movie like that's spoiling I don't know the like you know uh it wasn't big enough so I had to like go in the garden that we were filming in and pluck something out and put it there, you know? So some of the things happened while we were doing it. We couldn't prepare for everything, obviously, because sometimes the situation changes. Sometimes things, when you have it on the camera, because we couldn't do too many camera tests. Sometimes when you have things on camera, it sort of works out. But also because of COVID, I had to cut down on a lot of things on the film. For example, there was a shot I wanted of a, of a lizard underneath one of the um, like metal scraps of metal that they have in the background. And I wanted a lizard there, but uh, I couldn't get a lizard. And then like with the special effects, because we weren't paying for special effects or production designer, he knew special effects and he did some of them. So he couldn't do it like realistic enough. It's quite complicated to have like a lizard and everything. So that's one thing I was kind of disappointed about because in all my films, I like to put animals in them. Like my first film, Something Round in grad school, I had ladybugs all over the moon. And, you know, I like involving some sort of, I I like animals a lot of my films. In my features, I always write an animal in the script. My film flew. I had not, I had, well, I I guess I had dead birds. Uh, They weren't real birds, but you know what I mean? It's still an animal. Um, I saw your film uh, seed. Is, um, I don't, I don't recall there's an animal. Yeah, that's why the thing. There's no animals in seed. I wanted the lizard to be in seed, but I couldn't get it, so I was disappointed about that. So in seed, yeah, there was, there was no, there was no animals in that one. I, I wanted the lizard. You know, that was the only animal that was in the script that we didn't get to put in, but. Um, Otherwise, yeah, in the, the, I actually wrote a feature version of Seed called Ripe, you know, about ripe fruit. And in that, there's an ocelot, which is, you know what an ocelot is? It's like a, it's like a, it's like a, a jaguar or something, you know, um, it's not an ocelot. It's like a, it's like a cheetah. It's like, so I have like weird animals in a lot of my films and uh, again, it goes into this topic, like with seed, you know, with the environment and nature, you know, and um, seed was also a little bit touching on like the Me Too movement that was 
happening in Hollywood at the time in terms of like the exploitation, but not in the same way that, you know, Me Too, for example, has been portrayed in the media where it's also, it's, it's a lot more of like uh, sexual violence and things like that. You know what I mean? Seed was just more about just the metaphorical ex exploitation. Uh, and so um, there was like a lot of, I guess in in the film, like in the future, yeah, there's an ocelot, and I, I I love to connect the natural world with our world because, you know, even like today, for example, or yesterday, I was watching this Netflix uh sh documentary, and it's called Moving Art, and all it is is eight hours, and each episode is a different like, uh, city around the world, not city like an island or a landscape or whatever place, and. They just show all the nature and the animals in the place, but there's no narration. So I'm just watching like this nature video with no words for eight hours and I'm loving it, you know? So I just love, um, I just love like animals and nature. And every time I make a film at the end of the film, I get depressed. I go through post film depression and what really cheers me up is going to the zoo and so I always connect my films with animals because after I make a film, the next day when I'm depressed, the film is over, I go to the zoo. And that's just what I do, you know? Yeah, yeah, you're very connected to the nature. So animals, yeah, they are part of that. Yeah, yeah. I know, but this is, I, I'm just because just I'm connected to animals doesn't mean I'm the, the most. For example, my first film, um, what's it called? See, uh, Something Round. Uh, the ladybugs that we had on the moon, like a bunch of them fell off. I walked on the ground. A whole bunch died. I think we had a thousand ladybugs die. Um, my producer wanted to call PETA on us. I was so upset. Uh, you know, I was like, oh my God, the, the, you know, the ladybugs, you got the ladybugs from Amazon. And I think uh, we had someone looking after them and she started crying because she was so upset. The ladybugs died. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, this is so dramatic because of the ladybugs. Like, like, like the ladybugs was more, this film was about grief and people were grieving more about the ladybugs than about my topic in the film. I was like, oh my God, but maybe, maybe they should make a film about ladybugs dying next. I don't know. Out of that experience. Maybe, yeah, we could do an idea, you know, you, you never know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's not like just because I'm connected to nature, it doesn't mean I'm complete. I'm not like, for example, like I'm not like a complete vegan or something. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I like, I, I just think animals are really cool and stuff. But, you know, like, I'm not the most also like, I'm not like, oh, like, um, you know, like, like, I guess on the on the film sets, I exploit the insects. So mm -hmm. basically, you care, but um, I care. I care so much. I care so much, but I, but I, you know, I take advantage of them. You know, like I pour a thousand ladybugs on top of a moon, and only like twenty made it. You know, it was like terrible. It was actually like, you know, what it reminded me of. It was like when they tell you about all the sperm going for the egg, and only one makes it. That's what it felt like when I was pouring the ladybugs in the moon. It was like all the sperm falling on the, like the moon egg, and only like ten made it. <laughs> so yeah, it's like it's like a, a, an anecdote. Uh, yeah, from, uh, uh, but yeah. obviously, like you know, like, I, want... I, have, I have a dog also, so I'm very protective of more. I'm more, I'm very protective of like dogs and cats and pigs and foxes and goats. I used to go for meditation walks with goats uh, in like um, like these areas in Los Angeles. Uh, and I used to go for, yeah, things like, I love goats. Good. So. Good. <laughs> so they're good. good. Any, any animal, uh, it's, a, it's very, um, I don't know, it's like um, um, around them, it could be therapeutic, something like this, it could be peaceful, then something like this, yeah. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Um, I want to go back. The, the film, uh, not the process of making the film, um, but the camera, but uh, the video editing, but the sound, the lights. 
So basically, you told me that you trusted your crew uh, to pick up the camera, the lenses. Oh, we we worked together. For ex- we work. I'll talk about it more. We worked together, obviously. Like um, like in terms of camera, in terms of lenses. Yeah, my DP was the one who decided. We used these Leica R lenses. Uh, because of the low budget of our film, we couldn't have a stabilizer. We couldn't have a lot of moving shots. So it's a lot of it was stilts. So we focused instead on lenses to give it a better look. Um, in terms of lighting, I usually, when I direct, I, I for like lighting in different rooms or things like if there's a color or something, if I want it hot or cold or a tint of this or whatever, uh, I use an app on my phone and it has all the gels and you can press it and you can see how it looks in your hand and stuff like that. And then like my DP will go to the the lighting house and get the different gels for, for whatever. Uh, but on set, she had a, um, a, a gaffer who came with like a huge box of gels of her own gels. So we were very fortunate that one of our crew members had so much equipment of lighting equipment herself to be able to be used. So we were very lucky with that. And I think her name was Kate, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, because I'm not a hundred percent sure. And, um, so that's what sort of what happened with, with, with sound, you know, with sound recorders, they just kind of record the sound, right? That's not too, that's not too explanatory. You just tell them when, you know, you don't need sounds to save them time. But, uh, with a sound designer for this, there definitely was a lot of work. And with music, there was a lot of work. You know, I like to, in the, when I make a movie, this one movie has more music actually than most of my movies. I like to, um, make more music than cut what I need and what I don't need after, by, after I make all the music. And some of the cool things that we made with music were by accident. Like for example, when there's like the scene and the witch is like, you know, going to attack the girl and stuff. There's like this ticking sound, like tick, 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 like building up to it. And that was an accident because uh, we were playing the, the song and I was like, what is that ticking? And it was the metronome. And he's like, oh, that's the metronome. And I was like, oh my God, we have to put that in. You know what I mean? So that was like an accident because like we just heard the metronome and I was like, oh, I love that, you know? Or things like, you know... Um, when I work with music, it's really, I've learned now, music is one of my favorite things to work with. You know, I love, should, you just explain like the emotion you want. And Tristan, who's the composer, I've worked with in all my films, pretty much with the music. He's amazing. He's a pro- protege. He's like very young and he's like, a, he just graduated from, what's it called? Uh, Chapman University from the undergrad. And he's just so unbelievably talented. It's just insane. And uh, he's amazing because we work very well together and I can be like, oh, this part, like, you know, when you have the opening titles, you have that sort of like twinkling type sound. I was like, you know, like sparkles and things like that. And he like put that together and I was like, oh my God, this is so magical, but like creepy, you know? Um, so he's really good with that. So music is a fun thing. Uh, sometimes with, and with the sound designer, you know, usually you have to find a sound designer who understands you. Some sound designers will go too far and they'll put too much of their own stuff in and it could change the film a bit too much to not exactly how you want it. Um, and so you really need to work with a sound designer who understands, oh, like some sound designers really just like Foley and you have to really find a sound designer who's more into Foley or more into sound effects or what you need for the specific film. And in this film, I worked with this sound designer called Maui Holocomb. Holcomb and I worked with him on my feature at check-in as well and he was really awesome you know what I mean like he knew exactly like how, how to work the levels how to do everything he was really good with the sound design uh with the costumes I did the costumes so that's just kind of like my own imagination I go on Amazon I look up different costumes I want I buy them and then I do fittings you know I tried the witch on with like six different outfits and then saw which one fit best and which one I like best, you know? Uh, So costumes are one of those things I do. And also um, it's a good way for me to bond with the actors and get them comfortable because when I do the costume fitting, you know, we get to know each other a little bit more. Uh, I get to, they get to sort of understand the character a little bit more because costumes are such an important part of character. 
So it's really a really good way to help the actor to to work with the actor by doing the costumes also and to also get them to be more like into their zone of what they need to do. It's also like a free, it's like it's like, sometimes it can be like a free rehearsal because in America you have to pay for every rehearsal. Um, so yeah, so like uh, it was like one of those things and um, what else, what are the departments of it? So I guess that covers most most of the stuff. The editing uh, was, was a bit tricky this time. The editing, uh, I definitely go in a little bit more. You know, a lot of the times editors that I've worked with uh, like to just sort of like put the project together and then they're like, what do we do sometimes? And sometimes you see some shots might not work because maybe they go out of focus or something like that. Or, you know, there's a, there's a different thing. And so with editing, you know, I was able to fix the, we had, we did have some problems when we just put it in without like editing it in so certain ways, excuse me, sorry. And we were able to fix those problems with the editing. So that's the thing I love about editing is that it can make the film so much better. You know what I mean? Like you capture that one look in the witch that, you know, you, you were just going to get a close up, but now you have that look for that one line. And you're like, oh my God, that's not exactly what I was expecting. And it's amazing. You know what I mean? Um, so editing is very important. And I worked with an editor called Wiley Rush, who was very on point, very on time. You know, who's very, who's very professional, very easy to work with. And with an editor, you really want someone who's easy to work with because, you know, they're spending so much time on the project and you're, Sometimes you frustrate each other because you go back and forth. Oh, we need to change this. We need to change this. We need to change this. And actually, when I was editing this project, I was in Hong Kong waiting on my talent visa to return to America. So when I was editing it, I was I was here in Hong Kong when I was editing it. And it was a long process, the editing. And so it was over, like, because it was COVID also. It was, like, through distance. It was through distance editing so it wasn't in the studio where I could be like oh fix this fix this it was just through notes all the time or like zoom or whatever and so it definitely took longer because of the distance stuff and that's also the problem with sometimes with sound design I realize uh, a lot of the time a lot of my films don't let me into like the sound design room studio they don't let me into the editing studio they don't let me into the coloring studio so a lot of my feedback has to be always through written notes you know and i think it has to do with like the younger generation in the states they're not so much of an in-person generation they're very much of an online generation so they're like oh like we can just figure it out if you just do it online like we can just discuss it online but it's not the same at all it's a lot longer because you go end up still having problems which would have been fixed if you met in person do you know what i mean and it causes the whole production to take a lot longer than it should have to be honest so yeah that's pretty much uh yeah that is, that is, yeah um i would like to ask about about any for any project uh about the camera how do you do you choose the camera it's based on the budget or something else? usually it's based on the budget usually i'm one of those people where i love good cameras so I like to give a little bit more of the budget to the camera. But on this pro this project, we used my DP's camera, which was a Canon. I, I don't remember the exact model. It was a Canon something. And yeah, we used my DP's camera because it was um, free. That's why we just bought the lenses instead. Not bought, rented. Um, but usually my other projects, I've, I've worked with a Red. I've worked with an Alexa. Uh, I've worked with... Uh, I work with some pretty good cameras. My camera that I use in a lot of my one man shows is Sony A7S II. Um, and so I, I really do respect the importance of a good camera. You know what I mean? And sometimes when you work in a producers respect it a little bit less, I've noticed, because producers are all about we need to be on budget. Do you know what I mean? And DPs are the complete opposite. DPs are like, we need the best camera and equipment. And so as a director, you're kind of being the person who has to come in, come, 
I mean, you're not coming in between. You're kind of like finding a compromise between your vision and then the budget and then also having the good equipment and stuff like that. So for this, we use my DP's camera. And really, a lot of the times, it depends on what the DP feels comfortable with in terms of camera. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, I know some DPs love black magic, for example. When I was younger, I used to have a mini black magic pocket one. Um which it could shoot 4K back when 4K was like the biggest thing ever. And now you go up to like, I don't even know how many K, but um, you know, like uh, what's it called? Like, um, so it really also depends. Yeah. What camera the DP is familiar is, is more familiar with also, because that saves time on set. It saves time when uh, if they have to figure something out, if they have to change the gamma rays or exposures or, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, and DPs have their camera of choice a lot of the time, you know, they, they have their camera they like, you know, and so, uh, I like to trust, pick a DP I trust who feels comfortable with what they want to shoot with and then work to, uh, fix the look underneath those sort of things. But obviously, you know, my ideal projects, you know, if I ever become like a huge director one day, I would love to work with like, you know, bigger cameras, Panavision, all that kind of stuff, you know, like, you know, like all the like really cool equipment and everything because, you know, I want like a really cool film one day. I mean, I have cool films, but you know, I mean, like a big budget film one day, a feature one day. And so, um, so yeah, so I think cameras are very important. So yeah. But in indie filmmaking, things like Sony's A7S is a lot easier because a bigger camera also means uh, it's heavier, it's harder to kick around, it takes longer to set up the shot, you know, and that's what takes most of the time in filmmaking, setting up the shot, you know, the shot doesn't take that long, it's always setting up the shot, you know. The, the roll, the uh, shooting, the roll, uh, yeah. Bigger camera, bigger settings, and uh, people around the camera. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, the next question I would like to ask you is like uh, the overall, like, what is your best experience? My best, like on a film, my best experience. Hmm. Uh, I guess, I guess. My best experience I ever have had on a film was making my film something round because of two reasons. I worked with this director called Rachel Bickert and I respected Rachel so much. And I, I still respect her so much. She's amazing. Uh, I used to, I'm gay, but I used to put her on my phone as dream wife. And uh, you know what I mean? Like, um, what's it called? Like, uh, she is the best DP to work with in the world. And the second reason that was my best experience was because I worked with an actor on that set named Freckle. And Freckle was just so funny, but also a little bit rude at times to people, which wasn't very good. But Freckle was so funny. And if you have a great cast, it makes the project so much more fun. And I love my best experiences are always working with the actors, you know, the actors, because they're always, they're always down to like play around with like lines, with the dialogue, with this, with that. I love working with the actors. So basically any film that I work with actors that I, that, you know, are, are, are like really into the work and into the film, then I love that project, you know? So I guess that's been the, the best experience I had making something around, and flu was really good, but something round definitely was the best experience I ever had making a film. Talking about the cast, uh, um, I would say about the chemistry. Uh, you need chemistry between, between you, the director, and the cast, because uh, even between them, like the actors, you know, uh, if there's no chemistry, there, there's nothing, basically. It will, it will yeah. Be, Door. Yeah, you know, like, you know, the, I think as a director, part of your job really to get the chemistry is personally in the casting process, you know, uh, when we casted, we didn't cast them by auditioning people together, we casted them individually. 
And then the chemistry just sort of came in by sort of making them feel comfortable with each other during rehearsals. And a lot of actors are, you know, if they've gone to, through a training program, they know how to sort of react to other actors pretty well. So they sort of develop their own chemistry a lot of the time. You know, um, they weren't, you know, these actors I worked with aren't like super famous or anything. So they're, it wasn't like one of those things where we're so worried about like the ego to the ego of the actor. And actually a lot of the time I've noticed on the sets is what you want, which I've had some films where that has not been the case, like the first one something around where the cast doesn't have the same chemistry with the crew. And it's not like the cast has to have the chemistry with the crew because they say in a lot of sets, like no one talks to the actors except for like the first AD and the director or some, and the DP or something. But sometimes, you know, if you have an actor that the crew don't like, it can cause a lot of tension on set, you know, because people are working and they're setting up everything for the actor. And if the actor's not being completely respectful or something like that, it really, like, bothers the crew, you know. So there's a... But you never cast really on that. But, you know, like, creating the chemistry is really about just making sure everyone is comfortable with each other. You know what I mean? I try to really be nice as nice as possible with the actors i try to let them have as much fun as they want in terms of in rehearsals if they want to try something i'm like yeah go try it try try acting this way if you want or try try doing it this way and let's see how it goes you know and um when you start to feel like they have the freedom to express themselves then they are chemist then the chemistry comes out you know because you know they start to feel like oh, you know, like, I, you know, like, I, I, I trust this director because he's letting me tr say it this way and he's not being overly controlling and everything, you know? And we're all artists, so we all want the chance to express ourselves, you know what I mean? That's why we do what we do. Um, you always wanted to do this job, but can you make a living? Uh, yes, it's very possible to make a living. You know, if you go to grad school, you make a, there's a big network and everyone most 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 people i know from grad school make a living in this and sometimes it means like oh okay like i can't make a living exactly as a director right now but i can do it in other ways you know what i mean so that's why i prefer this multidisciplinary approach to filmmaking where you know i'm a writer also um for me it's been very hard i still live in my mom's house and i'm very privileged that my mom can like what's it called you know like support the both of us but that's also because I've been exploited so much by the industry, which is very different from other people, you know? Um, I remember, for example, like, but it's definitely very possible, you know what I mean? Especially in places where there's a lot of filmmaking, you know? Like, it takes a lot of time and practice to be good to make a living. You know, you have to keep at it. You have to not give up. There's going to be so many ups and downs. Like, the ups and downs I've experienced have affected me mentally in actually a really bad way, you know? Like... I am not, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's a very draining industry. There's so much exhaustion. There's so much burnout. There's so much competition. There's so much ambitious desire to make it and, like, what you do, you know? Um, at least from my perspective. And, you know, it's just kind of like, it definitely is very, very possible. You know, you have, there is some luck. It's, like, I like to say, is luck is a preparation. They say you have to be lucky in this industry, but luck is a combination of preparation and timing. So you have to be prepared and you have to be at the right time. And sometimes you don't make it till later in life. You know, like Helen Mirren wasn't even, uh, oh, sorry, like, like I think it was like Denzel Washington wasn't even in his first film until he was like 46 or something like that. You know, there are a lot of like people that make it much later. I think it's also like, um, if you look at, for example, like, uh, uh, there's so many famous directors didn't direct their first feature until very late also, you know? You have people that make it very young, and they're very lucky to do so, and they have people to do it later. And for me, it's been very difficult, you know what I mean? Like, I've been trying to, like, I've been knocking on doors nonstop. I've been writing nonstop. I've been directing, not nonstop, but I've been trying my best. And it's just kind of like, and so there are many points I've wanted to give up for sure. And, but then I'm like, what else do I do? Because this is all I've been training 
myself in since I was 22, you know what I mean? Or even younger than that, you know what I mean? But not in different ways, not like, you know, when I was younger, I was just trying to learn like production assistant stuff. And now I'm much more focused on the creative stuff. But, you know, it's just, it, it is hard, but it's very possible. And there was even a time in, when I was in L.A. where I was earning money by doing backgrounds on set. And because L.A. is such a big community of filmmaking in Hollywood, you can do, make a living just background actor. You know, there's a union for background actors. Uh, I think there was one day on set. I, I got paid how much on set? Like like eight hundred US just for one one day on set because we went overtime or something like that. And it was just, just being in the background, walking, you know, like not and it, it was a set with four hundred background actors. It was for an HBO show called Perry Mason. And I'm I worked background for a little bit. I worked on Modern Family, I worked in Grey's. I, oh, I didn't do Grey's. I, I had a back I complained about a back injury to get out of Grey's Anatomy. But um, that that's it. I was like, I'm the injured one. I can't be the doctor. Like, <laughs> but uh, what's it called? So uh, I worked on Insecure on HBO. I worked on um a Lifetime. Sorry, a a, su- a ch- something called Supermarket Checkout or something, which is like a cooking show. I worked on a Lifetime movie. So. Doing background, you you get paid a decent amount, actually, you know, but the only problem is that, that I stopped doing it was because it would be too draining on me because you're staying on set for like 12 to 15 hours. You're not getting treated the best. You know, you, you're standing a lot. It's very tiring. And, um, you know, I also worked on better things on FX, you know, so... uh yeah it's definitely doable but you have to you have to be open to the different the different aspects of filmmaking you have to be open to doing different jobs you can't just be like i'm only going to do this i'm going to stick to this i'm not going to do anything else until you make it then you can do that but like when you're struggling you have to try different things and then you can do it um yeah just uh i totally agree because uh you need to, I think you need to, um, what do you call this? Um, you need to add out branch, uh, not just acting or just making, but you need to do different stuff. Yeah, you know, and it makes you, whatever you're wanting to do, if you want to be a director, you want to be a writer, you want to be an actor, I've always felt like it's always helpful to try different things because it makes you as a character much more whole. You know what I mean? It makes you as a, whatever you want to do, it gives you experience. And experience is the most important thing to being uh, at least a director or a filmmaker. You know what I mean? Like, you can't be a very good director if you're not putting your, giving yourself experiences. Um, you know, and it helps with your communication skills, which is so important in all of it. It doesn't matter what job you're doing. Uh, it helps with uh, every aspect of it, you know. so. I think being open to doing different things is very is very important, especially when you're starting off, you know, or you're you're still trying to get that one thing that you're that you want to do going for you, so that you can focus completely on that, you know. And it depends on also what role you are. Like I have friends who are DPs, and if they're a DP, they got music video jobs. If they're not doing narrative stuff, they got commercials. They got like photo shoots. That was one thing I did once, you know, I did a photo shoot. I directed a photo shoot as opposed to, you know, to, to earn some money and stuff like that. Different uh, things to, different things to uh, find the job. Basically. Yeah, I mean, it's easier in Los Angeles. It's much easier in Los Angeles and New York than Hong Kong, for example. Here, I've been unemployed just doing my own stuff since October which is a while to be uh, not, you know, like on set properly or doing anything. You know what I mean? It's It it makes you sort of feel a little bit uh, distant and out of touch. But that's why I do my one-man shows, just keep up my practice, to keep my craft, to stay, um, you should call it, creatively fit, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think in Los Angeles, there is a moment of, there's, if you're there, 
you're still there, there's something, always something, it's called, something is cooking up. So you need to be Yeah, there. but you still need connections, even in Los Angeles. People like to get people they know and they work with, and they work with the same people over and over again. So you need connections so you can keep working with the same people over and over again. I uh, would like to ask you, did you use the crown, the crown founding for your thing? The what, I'm sorry? Crowd, crowdfunding? Oh, crowdfunding. No, I don't. No, I don't. Because um, my communication has been with the outside world, very limited, and people don't respond to me on social media or anything like that. So crowdfunding wouldn't work for me uh, just as someone also because when I was working in Hollywood, it was more of the studio system I was working with and crowdfunding doesn't really fit into that so much. And um, also, I feel like I'm not going to raise any money and it would be embarrassing. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's another job, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I once worked on a film uh, in L.A. and I was in Hong Kong and I was doing their working on their crowdfunding and they raised 150,000 U.S. crowdfunding. And how they did this was they got like a known actor and they got all these like benefits, you know, like, oh, if you donate this much, you get this and you get this and you get this. And people were so into the actors that they gave so much money to, you know, get an autograph or to get a picture or, you know, uh, a, a visit to the set. You know, I, I remember there was two women who paid 10,000 US just to come to set one day for 30 minutes just to see the actor. How much you said? 10,000 US. 30 minutes. Oh, oh, oh. You know, uh, like, it's actually kind of bad. I, I felt bad because I'm like, what are these people doing? You know, they're wasting so much money just to, what, see the actor? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's like, um, it's, 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 it's so strange, you know what I mean? And I guess, you know, like you get, you send, the actors have to give like videos being like, hi, whoever, you know, thank you so much for donating, blah, 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 blah. So it's not just work for the people, like the director and the producer and the people running the campaign. I was a social media coordinator. It's not just work for them. It's work for the actors as well, because they have to donate so much of their time beyond just, you know, acting in the film. And a lot of the time when that's the case, they have to really believe in the project because they have to be like, okay, this is time that isn't giving me money and I'm putting effort into it. And so you really need people to believe in your project and you really need a passionate group of people when you want to do crowdfunding and you need to really reach out to press, you know, you need to really reach out to festivals, to connections, spread word of, word of mouth, you know, crowdfunding, like you kind of have to be a little bit popular, I think, to do crowdfunding, you know? So you're talking about, uh, speaking about uh, festivals, can you tell me about your experience? I love going to festivals, you know, I haven't actually been to a festival since uh, a while now, you know, it got a bit expensive to travel, um, you know, uh, and during COVID, everything was online. So it was just kind of like, like this, like a Zoom and you just talk like this, you know. But I love going to festivals. You know, a lot of the friends I made that were really cool were other filmmakers I met at festivals. And that was the best part, always meeting the other filmmakers at the festivals, watching the other films. Um, you know, if you're lucky, you get to do a Q&A. And that's always a lot of fun. You know, sometimes festivals can be a little depressing. Like, I definitely played at festivals where there was like hardly anyone in the theater. And I was like, oh, this is so sad. But it was because of COVID, you know? Um, and, you know, like my work's been suppressed a little bit over the last like six months. So I haven't gone to so many festivals, but uh, festivals are, you know, uh, what's it called? Like, I, I love them. You know, I, I, I have never, I, I think that the best festival I played at is Cinequest. Uh, which is the top five festival in the U.S. But, you know, obviously my dream is to one day play at Sundance or Cannes or something. But I also, you need money to make films to play at those festivals also, you know. So I'm, no, I haven't done that yet. Uh, but hopefully one day, you know what I mean? And now that everything's going back 
opening back up, you know, and now that, you know, everyone's vaccinated and everything, festivals are going back and they're running and everything. So, you know, hopefully the festival thing stuff will happen soon again. You know, it's just kind of like, it's been a tough two years, definitely. But I miss the festival so much. I love the festivals, you know? Yeah, it's better to, to be uh, on, on site because you can be, you can see the audience, the interaction with the audience. You can ask a few different questions, of course, with q and Oh, yeah. And yeah. Uh, the feedback, of course. I think it's more the physical uh, interaction is better than the online. Of course, online is okay, it's good. But um, to be here oh. and to interact with the audience, and um, I don't know, it's like back and forth. Oh, okay. yeah, it's like human, it's like human interactions. I like the, I like that. I love it, you know, and also, like, if you think about it, like inside and stuff like that, I'm one of those people where, like, I get like a little bit of an adrenaline rush in the festivals because I'm like, firstly, I'm nervous. I'm like, oh my god, everyone's gonna see the film and I'm right here. And then, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like, you don't have to worry about that if it's online because you don't, you don't know. And then, you're like, okay, everyone saw it. Okay, that's fine. It's all good. And then also, like, I love, I love the red carpet photo. I'm always like, oh, what am I going to wear? You know what I mean? Like, you have to dress up. And what am I going to, like, you know, it's such a fun experience and everything, you know? So I miss the festivals so, so much. It's something, like, I, I want to keep, I want to keep playing in festivals, you know? It's it's one of those experiences that really means so much to me. Uh, talking about, okay, talking about, uh technology nowadays, uh, someone can buy a computer, someone can buy a camera and can start editing with it. Uh, do you think it's uh, the future of cinema? Do you think it's positive or negative? Uh, I think it's very positive. I think it's very great. That's what I do nowadays with my one-man shows. You know, I have my camera and I just edit it on Premiere Pro. I think... Um, you know, this way, even though it's a bigger budget film, people can still edit on their computers and it just makes it so much more uh, easier to work. You know, it's more convenient. You know, it provides accessibility so more people can make films. So there's more talent there. There's more availability to practice your filmmaking. You know what I mean? Uh, I love it. You know what I mean? I think I think it's a good thing that it, it makes it more convenient to, so more people can make films. Because I'm all about... Everyone should make films. Even if you're not a filmmaker, you should make a film. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's just like one of those things. Like, it's just like there's something. Films are about messages, not just messages. Films are about translating expression, experience, or, you know, teaching us something about, you know, the world or whatever. You know what I mean? And everyone has a voice that needs to be heard or a voice that should be shared with, on some topic or some experience or something that makes the world better, no matter who they are. You know what I mean? They have some experience that is enlightening. You know what I mean? And so that's why I think accessibility towards, uh, you know, computers and cameras and stuff and allow people to make films is, is so great. You know, I think it's a, it, it's not that it's the future. I think, you know, I, I mean, it is the future already, but it's not, it's not like going to replace the big Hollywood system with like all the big gadgets and all the big stuff, but it definitely is how you get there because if you don't make the films, you're not going to be able to play in the festivals and, you know, money is a very hard thing to come by, you know, when it comes to films. You have filmmakers I know that were really t terrific and didn't make a film for years just because they couldn't raise the money, you know what I mean? And having the accessibility to the computer and the camera and stuff it just makes it a lot easier to um, to put stuff out there and to share with the world uh, something that's personal to you, you know? But I would, um, I would add also um, technology for and uh, with AI and uh, deep fake video stuff. Like I do not like this. <laughs> I do not like that. I do not like AI. No, I mean, like, obviously with, like, Marvel film special effects and all of that, that's all really cool and everything. But AI, you know, I'm one of those filmmakers where it's like, I had to learn from, like, the ground up. You know what I mean? So I appreciate the realness of film. 
you know, not not exactly like cinema verite by itself, but you know what I mean? Like, I prefer, I prefer it when it's like, you know, like, like special effects is one thing, it's different, but AI and deep fake, it's just kind of like, it's scary because it's like, it's got, technology has gotten so good that it can like, they can make films without any humans anymore. Do you know what I mean? And oh, so I just have mixed feelings about the aging technology. I think it just depends on the actor and the director. And, you know, obviously I think for certain films it's a good thing. And for some films it's it kind of like, it's like maybe we should get a new actor who's younger. You know what I mean? You know, there is a new generation of talent that need to rise up. Not rise up, but that need to like have be represented, you know? But also you have the same thing where it's like some of the older actors are the better actors. Do you know what I mean? You don't have young actors as good as the older actors at all. I, I don't think so. Do you know what I mean? Or it's very, very, very rare. Like, who's the young Meryl Streep, right? Like, we don't know. Like, you know what I mean? I, I mean, there's, there's actually quite a few, probably, you know? But in Hollywood, I'm talking about. In France, you have so many. That's <laughs> right. DVDs now that uh, streaming services, uh, you can watch uh, younger, younger actors. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you can have a long career, of course. But, uh, it's, oh, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's a long way. <laughs> but uh, to the basic, the young one is older, basic. Um, I don't know, it's the talent, motivation. Um, if you're willing to continue, of course, kind of occupation, of course, but it depends. As an actor, you depend on people, <laughs> you see, on, the, on the director, and uh, if they want you to, to, to you, if they want you to, to your next movie, so that's uh, oh, yeah, you, what is the next always, project? That's always well, what, what we're asking. Project? What is the next project? You know what I mean. Hollywood keeps moving. It doesn't stop. It moves so fast. You're always like, what's next? What's next? Even as a writer, they're like, what's next? What else do you have? What else do you have? You know, I worked with this director, writer, Stephen D'Souza, but he's like a complete opposite. He's like, stay on the same thing. Stay on the same thing. You know what I mean? And I'm like, oh my God, like, I have to finish the crossing. I don't even know. Like, if, I'm like, hasn't it been finished by now? We've been working on it for so long. I'm like, it's so good. But, you know, um, it depends on the director and depends on the writer, you know? And obviously, you want a director as an actor who you can trust. Like, we were talking about, uh, you know, creating that chemistry and everything. And if the actor wants to look younger, then it's always a, it's always like, why not a little bit if it's okay for the film, you know? But also, at the same time, you have to worry because some actors get it a little bit too much. I worked in this one film once, and the actress wanted to look so much younger than she was and she put too much makeup on and she, she didn't want to do anything to like to like look more natural and so it was like you know like you need to definitely have a situation where there's a, a sort of understanding between the acting director and, and for me it's about what's needed for the film you know what I mean what is the most important thing for the film what does the actor need to do for the film? What does the director need to do for the film? You know what I mean? I think if you put the film first, then you're stepping on the right road. You know I mean? You're going down the right path, you know? Obviously, not, not when I say put the film first, I mean, like, in terms of the look and things like that. Obviously, humans are more important, obviously, than a, than a, than a commercial product, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah, sure, yeah. of course. Uh, but it's a project, a huge project, and you you run this project, basically, and you, you need to hire people to build build this project. And I uh, begin and I say, "Are you okay? Are you with me? One hundred percent? Okay. So, uh, on Burke, uh, come with me in this. Uh, we're gonna travel. We're gonna build this project. We're gonna make make uh, this film." And then uh, the priority is the, the film, of course. But uh, of course, um, um, in the same time, you need to think about the, the people. Right? They're okay. Uh, they're very far. They're, they, need, they need to be fed, you know, and stuff like this. 
and, uh, and so oh, on. Of course. I have a question. Is it recording right now? Okay, because I have... Yeah, it, it is. No, 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 because I have a pop up thing. See the red browser one? No? preventing recording. We recommend refreshing the page. But you said it's uh, recording, so I guess it's fine. It was there earlier. From, okay. For me, it's recording. It's recording right now. And uh, it should stay with. Okay, it's okay. Not I good, is like, you know, okay. not good. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, Says double shake. Good to have them. You never know. Uh, right. Can you tell me about the uh, film about cinema? What, what do you want to know? Cinema. Cinema, like uh, nowadays. What do I think about? Oh, okay, what do you think so about cinema. Nowadays, I think in general, it could be in America. I guess like you know, you still have the indie festivals. You still have those good artsy films and art house films. I think there's a younger trend towards young adult films and young adult actors that's sort of happening with a lot of films on Netflix, on Amazon. I think that's a trend. Um, you know, and there's obviously the big Marvel movie trend where there's like a Marvel movie every week coming out or something. And there's less of the sort of more... Uh, fine art sort of films, you know, but things are changing. You know, I've heard Jamie Lee Curtis talk about how she thinks that new movie, Everything Everywhere All at Once, is going to change how the studios run a little bit because they're going to see that you can take risks and you can do something different and it's still going to do so well and still can be an amazing film. You know, I think I read somewhere that people, studios are just kind of like following the same formula because they're too afraid to lose money. And this has been the same thing I've heard my whole time in my film career. They're just afraid to lose money. And everyone's like, oh, it's changing, but it's not changing. And it is a different time from, I guess, when I was younger in my teens. And you see the type of films that would come out and everything. They're more edgy, you know. And I think with the culture in America, there is a, um, a precaution not to offend anyone, you know. So they're getting worried about, about what they what's it called like what happened like what the topics of the films and what the studios put out you know what i mean but in terms of the independent film there's still so much variety and there's so much out there and it's really about just getting a good distributor and a uh that trusts you and puts your film on amazon or netflix or hulu you know what i mean to give it an audience you know it's really about finding the audience and it's unfortunate that some of the really really cool films i've seen that are indie uh, have not been able to have, like, a big theatrical release, you know, for everything. They have to go straight to streaming or something like that. But, uh, you know, it, it's it's just one of those things where the culture is catering to a lot of the young adults, you know. Uh, and I think that is kind of, like, a good thing in the sense that it's helping us progress as they're trying to, like, progress society through through it. But the problem with progressing society through it is they're too afraid to show things that are that were different or something. So it's like people are stuck on the same track or same wavelength. And to progress society, you need to show the difference, the differences, and you need to show variety and everything. You know what I mean? Yeah, but like you said, I think you nail it. It's about money. They need to secure money first. It's safety. It's yeah. Safety. And I don't even know why they have to be so safe. You know, it's because they spend like three hundred million on a Marvel movie. You know what I mean? If they just made ten really cool, not even ten, thirty indie movies of ten million dollars, that I wouldn't that be much better? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think they can. They can make a lot of. They need blockbusters, okay? They make a lot of money, and they can use this um, benefits to produce film. In indie filmmaking films. Yeah, yeah. They say things are going to change again. They said they said things are going to change again, actually. They said there's going to be, like, a new wave of them supporting indie filmmakers, but, but I haven't experienced it or seen it yet, so I'm not 100% sure when. You know, when you're a writer and director, you're not, I'm not actually put in the room with the executives or anything like that, so... I'm a little bit less in touch with that because I'm not able to uh, discuss with the executives what their train of thought is. Yeah. 
do you, do you think do you have an echo from Los Angeles about this change uh, by the, for, for indie films or not yet? It's too soon to to notice something. Um, it feels the same to me as like I don't know ten years ago. It just feels the same. Maybe it's too early. We'll see. <laughs> Maybe it's too early. I mean, it's just because you know. When you look at the good, successful indie films, you look at a lot of the films that have been nominated for Oscars, you know, because they, they don't, you know, you don't see like so many like Marvel films nominated for Oscars, right? Not too much. But then it's all, yeah, right, no. <laughs> Can you imagine if like Iron Man won the best actor, you know? Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> no. yeah could, could, uh, look at uh, The Dark Knight uh, for... Oh yeah, if... so Batman is different. For the Joker, you know, he, he, he won uh, both, I think. The Dark Knight, I think, and the Joker, but, the film, the won But the Oscar. Joker was, both were kind of different. The Joker was, I like the Joker a lot. The Joker was done in a kind of an art house way, you know what I mean? The Joker was not done like regular commercial films. It was very, it was like a big budget indie film, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, yeah. uh... The Joker was like brilliantly acted, so beautiful. But you know that is one role where the actor, whoever plays the Joker, is going to be nominated for an Oscar because it's just the character of the Joker that is so hard to act that in the history of whoever plays the Joker is like okay, that's like that's like a big like deal. You know what I mean? Because it's just such a demanding role. You know what I mean? You look at Heath Ledger who played it before and it like drove him insane. You know what I mean? You look at Jack Nicholson, who played the Joker, you know what I mean? You look at Joaquin Phoenix, like you, it takes a great actor to play the Joker, right? <laughs> it's just like one of those things, yeah. Uh, if you have the opportunity to work with someone, who could it be? Like an actor or director or, or, or... I would say actors, if you... And um, oh, oh, yeah. if you pick a director, it's like set, observe him or her. And, yeah. Oh, okay. So if I'm going to pick a director to observe, I would pick Anna Lily Amapur or Xavier Dolan or Wes Anderson or Tarantino or Guillermo del Toro. Uh, if I was to pick a actor to work with, I would pick, uh, again, Xavier Dolan or uh, Kate Beckinsale, or Billy Eichner. I'm really liking Alicia Silverstone's work recently. Uh, I would love to work with, I mean, there's so many. I would love to work with like literally every actor in Hollywood. I'm just saying, these guys I'm saying were people I used in my film, The Invite, like a, a FaceTime feature I did. So I, they're the most fresh in my mind. Uh, I would love to work with Joaquin Phoenix, with Reese Witherspoon, I would love to work with Nicole Kidman. Oh my God, she would be awesome. I would love to work with, uh, oh, oh, Kate Blanchett. Kate Blanchett would be amazing. You know, and Tilda Swinton, Tilda Swinton. And basically, they just need to look like an elf, and I would love to work with them. <laughs> Not an elf, an elf, sorry. Not elf, an elf. Yeah. Like, like from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, 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 elf. Yeah, I figure out. Yes, <laughs> but they're all good, basically. Yeah, they're all good. They're yeah. all good. You know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, of good actors in general. Do you know what I mean? And also because my boss was an A-lister, I was very, and I was like, you know, in social media connection with so many A-listers. That's kind of like the circle. I was like, okay, I want to work with these guys. Do you know what I mean? Um, you know, I would love to work with Michelle Yeoh. You know, she also seems awesome after seeing everything everywhere all in once. I would love to work with Aquafina. I, I approached Aquafina about working with her once also. Uh, I would love to work with Kiki Palmer or even like, um, what's her name? Like, just just so so many, you know, but I, I all my films, I'm okay with working with actors that are not super famous also. Do you know what I mean? Because... Like I said, it's about the acting, you know what I mean? And I love to work with Anne Hathaway, I guess, also. I love, a lot of my, all my films have women leads. So a lot of the times it's women actress, actresses that I would 
work with. I mean, not my first film, Something Round, had a trans lead um, who was non binary, so that's different. Uh, but otherwise, most of my films have female leads. I remember on the short feed, basically, uh, they're all women now, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just because, uh, you know, I like to bring diversity. I like to uh, underrepresented groups. And I guess also, it's just happened to be a lot of men don't want to work with me for some reason. <laughs> you know? I don't know why. Or I don't know if it's that men don't want to work with me. It's also like, I don't know, when I've worked with, I guess, you know, you can, I guess it's just kind of like, you can get more, like, subtleties with the acting from women, you can get more of a range of emotions, and I'd love to work with older men, because older men can do that too, but younger women can do that, and younger men struggle with that a little bit, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's a part of the process. It, 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 yeah, not everybody is like uh, the same. No. Uh, oh no, the, not at all. But the approach of, of work is different. So, you know, um, if I if I if I'm involved you know, in project as an actor, and for me the director will be uh, will be the, man the manager. Yeah, he, he, he runs the project. He runs the project. He or she, and uh, whatever she or he wants, uh, I do it. So yeah, yeah. But, but uh, if you need a French guy, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, for sure. All right. Okay. What do you wish in the short, mid, and long run? And what I wish in the my short, the long run of seed. Short run, mid run, and long, long, long run. Of my career. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so in the short run, I would like to get another contract to write a film, a big film. Uh, in the medium run, I would like to direct that film. And in the long run, I would like to be able to write and direct any film I want. <laughs> the idea is to, to continue. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's, I, actually, it kind of changed. In the medium run, I would like to also be an actor. I would like to be able to also uh, one day like act as a important, a, a supporting or leading part in a good movie. You know? You need to take different uh, opportunities. It's a different experience. Well, you know what it is for me? It's like, you know, I've done so much writing. You know, I've written like over 40 feature scripts and everything. I've directed a lot of shorts. So unless I'm directing a feature, it's also like I want to try something different. And acting is a little bit uh, different because it's like, okay, I can focus on another thing for a while. You know what I mean? Or something like that. So that's what's with the acting. And then with the directing and the writing, that's something I just want to keep doing the whole my whole life, you know, if, if it's possible. You know what I mean? It's very hard, you know. I, I think about it more, like you're saying, the continuity of it as opposed... I know a lot of people say, oh, I want to win an Oscar or something like that. But, you know, I'm not... It's For me, it's, that's not really what it is. It's really more about being able to keep working, making the work I want to work do, you know what I mean? Or at least close to what I want to do. Because... Anytime you work in the studio system or anything, there are going to be notes and everything's going to change. But to be able just to keep working and to, you know, have my life be legitimized in Hollywood and be verified and be, you know, with my fellow online social media A-listers and everything, working in the industry as a person as opposed to being kept away and hidden in a sense, that's what I want, you know? Yeah, yeah it's a... Okay, all right. Uh... For, do you have some tips for the newcomers in this uh, industry? Tips for the newcomers. Uh, so the first tip I guess I would give is 
when you're writing, I would start by like focus on writing a really good script. And when you want to write a really good script, just dig deep into your heart and try to be as personal as you can. Then cut out all the soppy stuff. Um, and then the second tip I would give is don't be afraid to take risks with your directing. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, look at great films, you know, that are old and new and see how they shot things and see how the acting is and how they shot things and see how you can create your own versions and things like that so that you can find your voice. And then when you find your voice, this is the third tip, don't let it go. And there are going to be many times you're going to find yourself losing your authenticity or your voice is going to be changing, you know, and embrace the change of your voice. Embrace the evolution of your voice. Cool. And also be professional and don't shout. I, I, some, I once shouted at someone that I shouldn't have shouted, my boss. And don't get angry. Be very calm and do not lose your temper even though sometimes it can be very hard because of the stress of the industry, but try to always remain calm and composed. Good. Uh, this one is very uh, uh, grounded. It's very, yeah, like, yeah you have a, no, an experience about the, uh, yeah, about this uh, filmmaking, yeah, definitely. Yeah, good, good tip for the last part, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the last question is, um, um, which movie or series that uh, looks like you? Looks like me? <laughs> I mean, there's so many, to be honest. There's so many. Uh, uh, that look like me? You mean like that, that I feel like I relate to the most? Yeah, it's something like uh, you relate to the most, of course. Something, uh, maybe a part of your personality. Uh, the, there, maybe there's a story, uh, yeah, something like this that's related relate you to the most, yeah. So it's one of my favorite films. It's called A Girl Walks Home Alone at Night, and there's this vampire. It's a vampire film. Have you seen it? It's a spaghetti western with this. It's an Iranian vampire film, and I related to the girl, the vampire, a lot, and. I wanted to be a vampire growing up, and now I don't want to be a vampire anymore. I'm like, I'm done being a vampire. I, I don't want to be a vampire. Like, you know, like, but that <laughs> film is what, like, I related to the most, I think, a lot of my time. And also this one film, my favorite films are the ones that are related to It's this one old film by Xavier Dolan called Mommy. She played at Cannes. And I had a troublesome childhood like that character. And so that film I related to a lot. And then another film, uh, recently, recently, I guess there are lots of films that have come out that I relate to a lot that I think have very similar images to things I've experienced in life and things I've really experienced. So you can find me on Instagram. My Instagram is Nikhail R, N-I-K-H-A-I-L-R. Uh, you can see my light paintings there. I'm also a light painter. Also, please check out Seed on IndieFlex. You know, you can get a, a free trial to for seven days and check out some awesome films and some great classic films. Um, my Twitter is also Nikhail28. Um, and also you can check out my other films, Flew Something Round and Playback on Reverie TV. You don't need a subscription for that. You can just go online and watch those films. Uh, and then you can check out on my YouTube page a few of my short that were more of my one-man shows, like My Boyfriend the Boogeyman and uh, things like that. Um, and and yeah, that's kind of that's kind of one of the... Oh, another film also. And also I want to promote the film Don't Worry Darling. If you haven't seen Don't Worry Darling yet, please watch Don't Worry Darling. It is an amazing film, and also I feel like that is my image also in there. <laughs>